At the beginning of the last century, when the Ottoman Empire began to collapse with the help of Britain and France, the Middle East turned into chaos. Italy took Libya, France wanted Syria, and Britain wanted to secure most of the land for itself, especially when oil was discovered and many European countries were slowly shifting from coal to crude oil. They couldn't simply take entire lands but had to set up proper governments in partnership with local tribe leaders. And Sharif Hussein, who was the ruler of Mecca and a direct descendant of Prophet Muhammad, signed a deal with the British that he would lead an Arab revolt against the Ottomans in exchange for an independent kingdom of Arabia. That will stretch from current days Yemen to Jerusalem and would include present day Iraq and Syria. It sounded like a good deal, a nation for the Arabs. The problem is that the British kept many details of the deal pretty vague and wanted to finalize them after the revolt. Unfortunately, Arabs agreed. At the same time, the British promised Palestine to someone else, which made it even more complicated. On top of that, a British diplomat Sykes met with a French diplomat Pico and drew the borders of the new Arab states based on their interest with literal rulers which contradicted the promise they gave to the Sharif Hussein. After the revolt in 1919, world powers came to a conference to draw the final lines and excluded all the Arabs from it, which is why there is so much chaos in the region. Palestine will be under the British rule, a new country will be created out of three different Ottoman provinces, which was named Iraq, France would take Syria with a separate country, Lebanon, and since the relationship between Hussein and Britain deteriorated, since the British betrayed him, I mean, who likes betrayal? The British supported another rising leader, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, that was much more radical. Hussein ruled the coastline and ibn Saud ruled the rest of it. But ibn Saud invaded Hijaz, the coastline, in 1925 and merged them into one country in 1932 to create the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And the next decades were filled with border disputes, wars especially with Israel, then dictatorships. And finally, it was turned into the Middle East we know it today. But if the British kept their promise to the Sharif of Mecca, the Arab world, or at least the entire Middle East, would be one country. Currently, there are 22 Arab states scattered around two continents, from Morocco to United Arab Emirates. It might seem like if they would unite like the United States, they will be an economic power, but they won't. Yes, overall the economy would be far bigger of, let's call it, the United States of Arabia than any state individually, but its GDP would only be $3.8 trillion. It would be far from the US $20 trillion GDP or EU's $18 trillion or China's $14 trillion. It would be the fifth largest economy behind Japan. Wealth inequality will be at its highest level, with some regions being super wealthy like Qatar, which has one of the highest GDP per capita in the entire world, and Egypt with just $2,500. The GDP per capita of hypothetical Arab Union would be $9,500, which puts it in comparison to China. But overall, it will have far bigger influence on the world stage, just behind the United States and China, since they will control over 30% of crude oil. The most important shipping route in the region, Swiss Canal, that connects the West with the East and will be the second largest country in the world with 13 million square kilometers just behind Russia. If the economy of the United States of Arabia isn't impressive, their military definitely would be. With a population of over 420 million people, you could only imagine how many young men and women would fit for military service. Currently, the 22 Arab states have a combined 1.8 million active personnel, with 1.7 reserve personnel. That is far bigger than the United States' 1.3 million or Russia's 900,000, but still behind China's over 2 million active personnel. But manpower alone isn't enough. In the modern world, technology plays a far more important role and some wars are taking place with unmanned machines. 
Currently, the United States is the biggest military spender on Earth with a budget of $750 billion, followed by China, which spends about $230 billion. The United States of Arabia will somehow have a similar budget to China's, but far better equipped with modern jets and tanks, and Saudi Arabia will be its biggest contributor. The alliance will have an air force with over 5,500 jets, helicopters, and would have some of the most advanced fighter jets in the world. That will make it the most powerful air force in the world just behind the United States and ahead of Russia. And if we take into account the land forces that include the number of tanks, armored vehicles, self-prepared artillery, that number will be dozens of thousands far ahead, even the United States. But the problem would be, all of these equipments, almost most of them, especially the modern ones, are purchased from the United States and Europe. Which means, in case of a war, the United States of Arabia will be at a considerable disadvantage. Such a hypothetical country will most probably work on getting its own nuclear weapons, and would ask for a place in the United Nations Veto Council. Despite its weaknesses, United Arabia will be a new force in the region and the entire world. It would directly compete with the EU and China. However, that's not the biggest obstacle. Turkey and Iran are the other two nations that are competing to be the leader of the region. Turkey, who was once leading the region under the banner of the Ottoman Empire, is trying to restore its formal glory. It's already playing a vital role in Syria and Libya. Iran on the other side that has been once threatened by an Arab state is trying to keep its neighboring states in check and grow its influence in the region. United Arabia will also threaten the very existence of Israel. In fact, it would no longer make any sense for the United States to keep supporting Israel at the expense of losing its relationship with the Arab world. Despite all of these obstacles, they could be solved. But here is the problem. It doesn't make sense economically for the Arab countries to unite, since some nations are incredibly wealthy while others are poor. It's unlogical for the United Arab Emirates that has a GDP per capita of $43,000 to merge with Tunisia that has a GDP per capita of $3,400. United States of Arabia is possible in theory. But over the last decades, some countries have become extremely wealthy, that they simply can't unite with poorer nations. But they can if they are economically equal. In fact, the Gulf countries like Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait are already united under the banner of GCC, Gulf Cooperation Council. It's a political and economic union consisting of all Arab states of the Persian Gulf except Iraq. You're probably guessing why. With a common market, it is the movement of goods and services, and GCC citizens can freely move and work in any of these nations. In 1950, France and Germany signed a trade deal to integrate their coal and steel industries, since they were the largest industries at that time. The trade deal turned out to be profitable for both countries. So next year, a few more countries joined. And in 1957, six countries met in Rome and created the European Economic Community to establish a single free market, cancel tariffs, and enable free movement of workers. It took many years before the policies of the treaty were implemented. In 1963, the United Kingdom applied to join the community, but France voted against it. In 1967, UK applied again and once again was rejected. And in 1973, it was accepted when it applied for the third time. Countries like Spain, Portugal or Greece were not even considered since they were ruled by dictators. But once dictatorships ended in those countries, they became part of the Union. Greece in 1981 and Spain in 1986 together with Portugal. But it wasn't yet the European Union we know it today, since the EU officially was created in 1993. In fact, Schengen, which is the treaty that allows EU members to freely move across the entire EU, was only signed in 1995. And the Euro, which is the currency of the European Union, 
went into circulation just 20 years ago, in the 2000s. In the following years, it began to expand, but challenges were only ahead. The 2008 financial crisis, the migrant crisis all led to instabilities like Brexit and pushed other countries to consider leaving the EU. It took two world wars and over 50 years for Europe to unite. So just because the Middle East is in chaos today doesn't mean it can't unite and stabilize since it has been once, especially under the Umayyad Caliphate. Countries will unite only when benefits outweigh the disadvantages. Since Gulf countries have grown wealthy due to proper management of oil resources, they have already created the GCC, which is almost like the EU and are working on the creation of a single currency. Of course, it will take many years before that happens, but that is normal. European Union began in 1957, since the Treaty of Rome, and only 43 years later, the Euro was introduced. The Council is expanding. Jordan, Yemen and Morocco are in discussion to join the GCC Council as well. Whether this union will succeed or not, neighboring countries with a similar level of wealth will always find it mutually beneficial to integrate their economies, allow freedom of movement and create joint military alliances. Just 40 years ago, even the GCC countries were under the line of poverty. Today, especially with the rise of internet and the spread of information, that might be possible, but unlikely in the foreseeable future. Only time will tell. If you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching and until next time.